Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Father, now we have expressed our hearts to you in song, in prayer, and worship. And now we ask God that you would open our hearts so that we might receive the things that you have for us this morning. I pray that you would encourage us and challenge us and stretch us and grow us and bless us. Teach us your word, Lord, that we may walk in your ways and please you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Almost 500 years ago, uh, a man by the name of Edmund Spencer wrote an epic poem called The Fairy Queen. And uh, my my wife's middle son, um, Sam, had a did a doctorate in English literature at Oxford, and he did his dissertation on that poem, The Fairy Queen. Just a little plug for my brilliant wife and her wonderful kids. Um, the, the Fairy Queen was an allegorical work, and it... it um, celebrated a cluster of virtues, but in an early chapter, using the imagery of a parade, Spencer brought into our view a a group of characters that represented the seven deadly sins, the counterpoint to virtue, uh, lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride. And and in in the, the, the Spencer, as he describes particularly the one about gluttony, uh, just painted a, a picturesque caricature that that shows us what gluttony is like. And, and this is older English, so it's going to sound that way a little bit. This is pre-King James English, okay? But he says this, and, and by his side rode loathsome gluttony, deformed creature on a filthy swine. His belly was upblown with luxury, And also with fatness swollen were his eyes. And like a crane, his neck was long and fine, with which he swallowed up excessive feast, for want whereof poor people oft did pine. And all the way, most like a brutish beast, he spewed up his gorge, that all did him detest. In green vine leaves he was right fitly clad, for others' clothes he could not wear for heat. And on his head a ewe girland had, from under which fast trickled down the sweat. Still as he rode, he somewhat still did eat, and in his hand did bear a boozing can, of which he supped so oft that on his seat his drunken course he scarce upholden can, in shape and life more like a monster than a man. Isn't that a graphic picture? What what wonderful language to describe the sin of gluttony. It's an exaggeration for effect. But, But we have all known gluttons, haven't we? Um, Individuals who may eat and drink themselves into an insensate stupor. Uh, They they may not ride pigs, (laughs) but when it comes to eating, there's no off switch. And to be fair, while we might never classify ourselves among gluttons, uh, most of us have experienced gluttony. Ever eat? so much that you hurt and you kept on eating? Ever been to a church potluck? <laughs> I remember one time I, I was home from college and uh, I, I was looking for a snack in my parents' refrigerator, maybe some ice cream, and I opened it. The only thing in the, in the ice cream thing was a tub of Cool Whip. So I thought, well, that's sweet and that's good. And I had a bite and I ate the whole tub and wished I hadn't. For many years, I met with some other pastors from the Jackson area. We'd meet once a month at Bob Evans' restaurant, and we'd have breakfast and talk together and pray together and share ministry concerns and needs and so on like that. But I remember one time we went in, and they have the placemat there, and they advertise what you can eat. And this particular placemat was an invitation to indulge, and and not just in pancakes, but in uh, stacked and stuffed hotcakes, tusked. T- uh, topped with roasted caramel apple cream. <laughs> you know, in this beautiful picture there, it's an invitation to indulge. Um, uh, just another American reminder that encourages me to excess, and not just with food. We, we supersize everything, and, and our appetites crave everything. 
I don't need that kind of encouragement. <laughs> My natural bent is towards indulgence. I'm part of the generation that, that crafted the slogan, if it feels good, what? Do it. Yeah, you've got permission. On personality profiles, I test as impulsive. Um, and, and all my fleshly appetites resonate with Nike's mantra, just do it. Just do it. Indulge. We have been with the Apostle Peter on, on what can only be described as a journey of spiritual formation. God's divine power, Peter assures us, has given everything we need for life and godliness. God's very great and precious promises enable us to participate in the divine nature, to become more like God, to become more like Jesus Christ. We who have escaped the corrupting influences of the world and, and, and uh, because of untamed desires and lust, and, and in light of these incredible provisions, Peter urges us to a cluster of seven magnificent character traits that are like Christ, that are like God. It's an outward manifestation of the transforming power of grace. We began with virtue. He says, add, supplement your faith with virtue. And, and virtue is that moral excellence that God works in us as he conforms us to like Jesus. It's, it's the first thing that happens in a brand new believer. We want to change. We want to get rid of bad habits. We want to do right things. So life in Christ begins with virtue. He says, build moral excellence in your life. And, and then as we learned last week, uninformed virtue is unformed virtue. We need to know what virtue is because in our world that gets all twisted. And sometimes our world says these wrong things are right and these right things are wrong. And, and if we listen to the world, we're going to get all messed up. So we need transformation. We need, with virtue, knowledge. Knowledge of God's Word. Dig in and grasp God's truth. Jesus has commanded us to love God with our heart and soul and mind and strength. The Apostle Paul called for personal transformation by the renewing of our minds. And that takes knowledge of God's truth imparted and planted in us by God's Spirit. Our minds matter, so we need to know God's ways and God's words and God's desires for us. Cultivate an inner landscape, informed and reformed and transformed by God's truth. Supplement your faith with knowledge. Well, what's next? Well, Peter says, for this very reason, because God has done all these good things, Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control. Self-control. That's what we want to talk about this morning. Peter had three words that he could have used to describe self-control. One of, one of them is, is napo. Napo doesn't mean anything to you in English, but it means to be sober. Not drunk. Not impaired. And it, it's applied metaphorically to our thought processes, to think clearly. We're to be sober thinkers, and that's what, how NAFO is used. We're, we're serious. Uh, the NIV, the translation that most of you have here, uses self-control as to translate NAFO in many passages. Another word that Peter used is the word sophron. Sophron is related to the word sophia, which we know as wisdom. Um, and it, it means sensible, possessing a sound mind, a healthy mind, a mind that's thinking straight, thinking right. Now, Paul used this word in his, the qualifications for elders. He said that uh, elders are to be, among other things, hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, that's sophron, upright, holy, and disciplined. And, and both of these words, both napo and sophron, connect self-control with the ability of the mind to think clearly and then manage the emotions by right thinking. Thinking with minds unclouded by those lusts that war against our souls. But Peter didn't choose either one of those words. He had another word that he used. 
along with informed, healthy minds, we need empowered wills. And so Peter chose a word that speaks to that. Add to your knowledge, self-control. The word is egkratia. Now you're getting a Greek lesson this morning. I, I, pastors aren't supposed to do that. I know that, but I'm doing it anyway, okay? I, I, I'm an old man. I can get away with it. <laughs> egkratia. Literally, it's, it's a compound word that's made up of a preposition, and I won't explain why it's this spelled this way, but N is the preposition which comes down to us as in, and kratos, which means powerful. We have words like democrat, power of the people. We have um, aristocrat, which is power by a privileged class, autocrat, ruled by one person, bureaucrat, ruled by people who sit at desks. You didn't know that was the etymology of that word, did you? <laughs> I didn't either. Well, uh, put, put these words together, egkratia, and what you have is an inocrat, someone who's empowered on the inside, strengthened on the inside, self-control. And by the way, egkratia is a polar opposite, and that's akrasia, not powerful, self-indulgent. Lack of self-control. Jesus accused the Pharisees, for instance, of being clean on the outside, but greedy and self-indulgent on the inside. And the Apostle Paul warned Timothy about terrible times in the last days. People, Paul said, will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control. What a terrible description of our contemporary culture, isn't it? Having escaped the corruption that's in the world that caused by evil desires, if we want to live godly lives and participate in the divine nature and the culture in which we live now live, we must cultivate self-control, the inner strength to say no to those things that our fleshly appetites crave and want and desire but things that are either in excess or out of bounds. Self-control is somewhat synonymous with self-discipline. They're kind of opposite sides of the same coin. Um, an article that appeared in a, in a paper in, in Fredericksburg um, notes this. Self-control says no or stop. Self-discipline says go and keep it going. And they illustrate that. Deciding to stop eating sweets and to start eating vegetables are separate psychological functions. The first takes self-control, the second takes discipline. You can easily succeed at one and fail at the other. They aren't the same process. In other words, self-control hits the stop button and says, I, I, I can't do that. I, I have this desire that's, that's emerging in me that I need to say no to in order that I can say yes to those things that are right and proper and good and then begin to build discipline into my life that creates new pathways in my thinking that allows me to change in my behavior. We supply self-control to knowledge. Why? Well, self-control is the necessary empowerment of the will Stop doing what the transformed mind has come to understand is wrong. For instance, how many of you married couples have ever been on the verge of a fight? Okay, just Susie and me, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, it happens. But think back to a time when your words became heated. And, and while you're engaged in this verbal sparring, a real stinger pops into your brain. The perfect comeback. And, and you know, you know, when you say it, it will score points for your side and trigger your mate. And your mind warns you of potential consequences, even as the words are forming on your tongue. And out they come with disastrous results 
as the uh, country western song goes, I know what I was feeling, but what was I thinking? <laughs> well, we weren't. The, the problem isn't that we didn't know what might happen. We knew exactly what would happen. The problem was that our transformed minds weren't working with an empowered will to say no to what we wanted to say, to our angry impulse and making it stick. So when do your cravings and impulses overwhelm your, overwhelm your wisdom or moral sensibilities? When do you struggle with self-control? With your eating habits? On the internet? At the bar? With your secret stash at home? Uh, Christianity Today magazine has an article on the current issue describing a growing problem of alcoholism, secret alcoholism, among Christian women. Uh, these women report feel a report feeling trapped in secret shame. They're afraid to talk about a church because you just can't talk about that. That's not what Christians do, and so they carry this thing. They're afraid to talk about them, even as mommy wine culture memes and rose all day slogans echo in their minds and justify their indulgence. Um, Our cravings and impulses overwhelm our wisdom and moral sensibility. Maybe it's an available co-worker at work or behind the wheel of the car. Or ever lose control while you're driving. You may not express road rage to the other driver, or you might. When do you act out with behaviors or addictions that you know are wrong? We all need knowledge. We need solid transforming truth. But we need more than knowledge. We need empowered wills that are capable of stiffening our resistance against sinful passions and lusts that war against our souls. Well, so how does that work? How does that work? We'll go back to verse 3 again. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. So what has God given to enable us to experience self-control? Well, one resource that God has given is each other in the body of Christ. James, in his little letter, his uh, rather plain-spoken little letter, said, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great powers as it's working. You see, unconfessed sin... And shame ha have a power that's in, in secret. It's in the dark. A and you're just scared to death to let anybody else know what's going on. But finding a godly confident, a good friend who sticks closer than a brother or a sister, someone you can trust, someone whose wisdom you trust, and you've developed a relationship with them, and you begin to sit down and talk to them and say, could I, could I tell you something that I don't want to tell you? And, and you share that thing. It's so hard. But when you do, the secret spell is broken, and it's out in the open, and they pray for you, and all of a sudden, you sense a freedom that you never felt before. Because now it's not your secret to bear by yourself anymore. You've got a brother or sister in Christ who's carrying it with you. If you have a secret sin that's out of control, let me encourage you to find somebody here in the church that you trust, somebody you look up to, a person of wisdom and integrity, and ask them, could we have a conversation? I need to talk. Um, you see, their prayers have great power before God. So one of the resources that God has given us, even for self-control, is one another. Just that accountability with one another. I have a good friend um, who's been a friend for 35 years, and um, he's a fellow pastor, and we talk regularly. And right now we're talking every week because his wife has ALS and she will die. And we talk about what he's facing and the fears and, and some of those things. And we've done that for all these years. 
Those are precious relationships. And I would encourage you to cultivate something like that uh, here within the body or maybe it's somebody in another church that you've got a close friendship with you can talk about. Knowing these people know you and still accept you and are praying for you is empowering. It's liberating. The second resource that God provides for us is something Paul described in, when he wrote the church in Galatia. The fruit of the Spirit, right? The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Egkrateia. Self-control. It's an outcome of God's Spirit filling us and producing Christ's character in us. And, and I think it works something like this. Maybe you're, you're sitting at your computer and you've just done a Google search for something and one of the things that pops up in that feed is something, you're, an invitation to something you weren't looking for. It's, it's an invitation to click this and it'll take you to a pornographic site and all of a sudden your mind just rushes in with all the illicit pleasure you might get from that. And you didn't ask for this, it just showed up. And, and you find your hand moving your mouse over towards that. And sinful desires have risen up and they go to war against your soul, against what your mind tells you is right and pure, and they whisper seductive lies and rationalizations. And at that moment, we need to step into God's presence. We just need to stop and to step into God's presence and cry out for grace to help. Because God's Spirit will magnify that little desire that we have that feels so weak in the face of our, of our uh, temptations and make our ability to say no stick. He'll magnify that capacity to move on our internet search, maybe turn the computer off, do something else, to shift our thoughts. The writer of Hebrews makes this clear. He says, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted the way we have, yet without sin. You believe that Jesus experienced sexual temptation or temptation to overindulge in food or drink or to be angry or all of those things? He, he experienced all those temptations, but he never gave in to any one of them. He always said no. So what's next? Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus knows exactly what we need in that moment to do the will of God. So we cry out for mercy and for grace to help in time of need. This little microphone in front of my mouth turns the sound waves from my voice into electrical signals. And there broadcast back to a, a soundboard and through the soundboard into an amplifier. And that amplifier takes this little weak signal produced by my vocal cords and amplified by my own sound system in my head, all my resonating chambers. And it makes it powerful enough to fill the whole room. Um, without the amplifier, a sound system is worthless. <laughs> You've got to have that power boost. And the Holy Spirit's enabling, I think, functions something like an amplifier for our wills. And we make a real choice. It's weak and it's waffling, and we say, God, help. And God hears that. And he gives us grace by his Spirit and strength by his Spirit. We're not, we're not just throwing words into the air. We're rushing into God's presence, seeking mercy and grace for help to find, to find help in time of need. And God's Spirit gives us the enabling power to make that no stick. That amplifies our no so that we can do what we want to do, so that we can say no 
to exercise self-control in the face of our temptations. It gets even better than that. <laughs> Paul uh, makes an ironclad affirmation just a few verses later. He says, walk by the Spirit and you will not glorify the, or gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And, and Paul used a double negative in that sense when he says you will not. He, 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 it was his way of adding an exclamation point. In English, we use a double negative. It kind of reverses the negative. In Paul's day, when you use a double negative, negative it makes it twice as strong. We absolute, absolutely will not never give in to our sinful desires if we're walking by the Spirit. If we want to richly supply self-control and knowledge, if we want to empower our wills to do what our informed and, and transformed minds understand to be right, then, then we need to be strengthened on the inside with God's power by keeping step with the Spirit of the living God. And keeping step with the Spirit is all about habituating ourselves to His presence in our lives, submitting to His purposes. And the more we walk with God, the more accustomed we become to grace, the more natural it becomes to cry out to Him expectantly and to find that grace to help that He's promised. When confronting those powerful urges that come from the sinful parts of our lives that are still there, they're going to be with us until we die, until we're glorified and we stand before Christ. When I was a brand new believer, I was attending Bible college. I had transferred in from Western Michigan University, and I knew that I wanted to head towards ministry. And one of the courses I had to take was a, a course in psychology. You know, it was just the introduction to psychology. And as part of that coursework, our, our instructor gave us a personality inventory. And when I got the results back, um, that, that inventory scored uh, nine different personality variables that you could, you could, there was a trait and the trait opposite. For instance, one of the traits was, was active social and the other was quiet. You know, the active social person, they're the, the, they're the extrovert. The quiet social person is the introvert. You know, you prefer a quiet, restful life. Um, and on, on through them. And one of the, the, the last one that we looked at was, self-controlled or self-disciplined versus impulsive. And I looked at my score, and the professor said to the whole class, not my score, but about my, <laughs> what, it was where my score was, that people who score down in this range are people who struggle with alcoholism and drug addiction and things like that. And I was crushed. I thought, God, you've called me to ministry, and and, and this is where I am? Um... And as I prayed about that and talked about that with the Lord, um, He, through the process of other instruction that we received there in church and so on, began to understand what life in the Spirit was all about. And one of the first disciplines that God began to build in my life was, was daily, most days, uh, Bible reading and prayer. I just had to do that. And it became a, a consistent discipline, and that led to other disciplines in my life. And if you know me at all, I, I can be almost obsessive-compulsive about some things now, <laughs> like loading the dishwasher. There is a right way to load the dishwasher. And there's everybody else's way. And I look at that and I think, God, you've done a good work in me. You changed. And I I'll still can be impulsive. I mean, look at my workbench in the garage. You know, it's kind of a mess. Um, but God gradually built that into my life over the years. I'm not glorified yet. But praise God, I'm not where I was. And God has given me that grace. Um, adding self-control to knowledge has been significant in my walk with Christ. Churches, I think, are better at the knowledge piece than most of the other virtues. Um, most of our ministry programming is about imparting truth. Our primary discipleship medium is Sunday school. 
knowledge matters. You have, at this point, a teaching pastor. I think Pastor Scott had a teaching ministry here. And knowledge matters. It is vital that we pass on the content of our faith to ourselves, to others, to children, to train our children, our church family to think biblically. That's always been a passion of mine. But in his great commission to the church, Jesus commanded us to teach his followers to do everything that he commanded. Now there's a knowing that precedes doing. You know, the, the what would Jesus do question. Uh, you, you can't do what Jesus did unless you know what Jesus did. So we need to know what Jesus did so that we can do what he did. Um, that takes knowledge. of under, Otherwise, we're just kind of immersing Jesus into our idea of what should be. <laughs> and he goes contrary to that a lot of times. Being faithful and developing fully devoted followers of Jesus means being schooled in obedience. And that takes self-control. So add it to the mix. Send your will to God's gym for strength training. <laughs> Richly supply your growing body of knowledge and understanding of the Word of God with that necessary empowerment of the will to say no to sinful passions and desires and yes to what your transformed mind is telling you to be right. This last week I, I was looking at, I check out the Gospel Coalition site because they have a number of articles that are very helpful. And, and Sharonda Cooper um, had an article on the fruit of the Spirit. And she says this, The world says, follow your heart and be true to yourself. But Jesus says, if anyone would come after him, let him deny him, or if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. According to Jesus, obedience means laying aside our love of comfort and to pursue obedience. This is hard to do. But God provides help in the form of self-control, a strong ally in our struggle against sin. As the Spirit works within us, He frees us to be the kind of people who can say no to what feels good so that we might say yes to what is good. And there's the key. Self-control gives us that inner strength by God's Spirit to say no to what feels good so that we can say yes to what is good. And in so doing, become participants, partakers of the divine nature, to become more like Jesus in our actions and choices. And so, Father, we ask that you would build this grace into our lives, that we might be a people who are known by our constraint when it comes to those passions and desires of the flesh that rise within us, that we might become godly men and women, that we might declare your glory and your praise. For your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.